Again, good afternoon. Welcome to the second part of my uh, HTML5 session. Now I will speak about uh, cascading style sheets. I will speak about uh, Canvas. So this is the system I can paint on web page, and I will speak about uh, SVG. The probably the biggest change in CSS3 is that the work on the new CSS3 rules is split into modules. So there are different modules in CSS3 now, and the guys from W3C can work on those modules, you know, in parallel. So the work goes better for work. Here is the some list. Uh, is the list of some new CSS3 modules. They are coming more and more. For example, there are 3D transformation. You will see 2D transformation today. But as I told on the first session, be very careful what are you using from CSS, what are you using from markup, what are you using from JavaScript APIs. Because those specifications are not ready and those specifications are really not finished. I show you the list of uh, CSS3 modules with information about uh, status. So if you go to w3.org and you can find the current work page on CSS3. like I have problems with my connectivity. Okay, never mind. Ah, here we are. So what is green is good, what is red is bad. And if I scroll down, it's too much red there. Let's start at the beginning. You will have absolutely no problem with CSS 2 level 1. It's implemented in all browsers. It's absolutely no problem. You will have problem with some CSS 3 modules which are red here. The red means working draft. I don't know how many of you have been on the first part of my HTML5 seminar here. The working draft mean it's a status of the W3C specification and it means we are working on it. There is LC, it means last call. It's almost finished and they are waiting if there are some big issues. If not, there will be candidate recommendation. If there are issues, it goes back to working draft. PR is proposal recommendation, so it means it's almost ready. And RIC is recommendation. It's done, it's finished, and it will not change. But there are a lot of modules that are really not finished and are in working draft. So you will see some of them. And if the module is in working draft and the modules is unstable, so it means they are, they are, they are they expecting the changes in that module, the vendor browsers or the web browsers vendors, the companies producing web browsers, are using vendor prefixes. You'll see it, for example, in transform and in grid. Now, I will go through some modules which I think are important and interesting one. So, of course, I will not show you everything because we can spend a week around this. The first could be transforms. 2D transforms, and they are working on 3D transforms, allows you to manipulate with any box element. So for example, you can rotate element, you can change the scale of the element, you can skew the element, so you can really change in 2D space any box element. Of course, I'm not sure if some lady in some financial department will be happy if you turn the form for filling invoice 280 degrees, but it's possible. Maybe you have seen this uh, when I showed uh, the, in the last session when I showed the uh, work with the video. So let's have a small look around this. OK. 
Okay, issue studio. Transformations and of course. This is a standard picture, the original one. Then I use the function translate, so it means I move it. I scale it to 50% and I rotate it. And if you want if you use the transforms in the smart way, you can for example make a cube like this. And of course on every side of the cube you can run, for example, video. It's no problem because the video element is a box element. So how is it done? I am using transform rule and as you can see here I am using a vendor prefix. It means it's unstable, we know about it, it's a some kind of some kind of warning, so you can use it, but it can change in the future. Take vendor prefixes as warnings. So if I want to, for example, run this in another web browser, I need to use more vendor prefixes. So for example, I need to add vendor prefix for WebKit. It's a Chrome and uh, Safari. For Firefox, again, vendor prefix is Mozilla. Okay? So vendor prefix is, let's say, some kind of warnings. Here we have very popular module, background and borders, and this module is popular just for because of one rule, and it's border radius. Because in the past, if you want, if you wanted to have uh, some border radius and so on, you have to use um, pictures and it really didn't work in a very smooth way. You have a text shadow, you can use the text shadow, you can scale the background, so you can do quite a lot with uh, this new module. Here you can see a screenshot, the screenshot is from Expression Web 4 SP2, it's a tool for writing, uh, for editing HTML, CSS, ASP.NET code. It's more for, it's, you can imagine it's a future version of a terrible product front page. And now we have the support for CSS3 in this uh, uh, tool, Expression Web 4 SP2. Okay. Border radius, the shadow, and here I have a picture on the background and it's scaled to 40%. How is it done? Everything you see with uh, this green line at the bottom with this underscore with the green, it means it's not a part of CSS2 level one. So I switch on parser for CSS2 level one and it tells me, okay, it's wrong. So everything it's wrong here, it's from CSS3. I have, oh, another <coughs> thing you can find here is opacity. It's again new one. Border radius. If you if you have just one parameter, it means all bo or corners are the same. Or you can put there four parameters, so every corner can have different radius. And here we have the background size. So I'm using for background. I'm using uh, this picture. And I scale this picture to 40%. Fonts module. I think this module is quite important because you know all the new web presentations are more and more, you know nice and they are using a lot of technologies but uh, if you use the some font and this font is not available on some system it can really destroy your layout it was all time possible to embed fonts to our web presentation it was possible i think in internet Explorer 3 and netscape navigator 3 you know many years ago 
but every browser does it in different way. Some browsers support the true type, another supported the open type, and it was not standardized. Now we have standardized it. There is a new working group, W3C Web Fonts Working Group, working on a new format specific for web. The name of the format is WOFF, and this, is, this should be and it will be the main format to embed fonts to your web presentations. Of course, every font is some kind of you know, artwork or creative work, so it's not possible just take some font and put it on the internet. So you must have the rights for this. So you must buy fonts with those rights, or you can use in, uh, there is a big uh, gallery from the Google, so you can use the Google fonts from uh, Google font gallery. What happened, or why, why is this uh, system so important for us? I show you a small sample how you, the common way how to use fonts. This is this line. Okay, use the Time New Roman font. If there is no Time New Roman on the system, use Georgia. If there is no Georgia, use font from the family serif. So the serif is not a name of the font, it's a family of the fonts. You know, this is those font with this uh, parts on the bottom. I have no idea how to say it in English. In Czech, is it Patkové pismo? I think I help you. Okay, so do you know why this, uh, why we have this combination Times New Roman and Georgia? The Times New Roman, it was the default font on the Windows operating system, and the Georgia, it was the default font on Mac. And the same is for the rest of the operating systems. But if you use this this way, you can have problems with the layout. Here you can see two paragraphs with the same content. The top paragraph uses the uh, Times New Roman, and bottom one uses Georgia. And if you look at it, it's almost the same. But just check the first line of the paragraph. There is a difference. Those two fonts are very close to digger, together, but they are not the same. So it means it can destroy layout because something can be longer, something can be shorter, depends on the font. So this is the reason why we have possibility to embed fonts to our web, uh, to our web uh, presentations. So how to use it? First, I show you a page with a lot of fonts. So you can see how the fonts are downloaded, and everything here is a different font. What's interesting in uh, Internet Explorer, if I zoom, the fonts will be very nice rendered, because everything inside the Internet Explorer 9 and 10 is uh, hardware accelerated on the graphic card. So we are using, for the rendering fonts, we are using the direct draw, so it's very nice, smooth. And if you take another web browser, it looks ugly. So if I zoom here, it looks strange can see it. It's like stairs. Nothing smooth. The reason is that Chrome cannot work with the correct way with the possibilities of the operating system. It renders everything uh, by itself. Okay. How you can embed font to your presentation? Font, font, fonts. Where is my demo? Here. Here we are. It's very simple. You just tell. For the font in this file, use this name, and then you are using it in the common way you are using the fonts. Here you can see I have some embedded fonts from Google, and if you run it, I have different fonts. As you can see here, 
I have the first character of the paragraph is different because I have used here some pseudo selector. And this selection, it means you can change the style how the selected text looks like. So for example, now I have the yellow background, the standard one is blue background and the inverse foreground. Media queries value. I think this value is definitely the most important one. You know that in the past you had the media queries you had, so you can choose between two two cascading styles. You can use you can have you can have one cascading style for the screen, one cascading style for the printer. The media queries can you can for using this you can make a very sophisticated rule query to ask about you know, possibilities of your, about your behavior of your screen. So, let's make a small statistic. How many of you have a smartphone with the web browser? Tablet? Some netbook with the low resolution? Okay. The netbook, notebook, laptop with the standard resolution? The high definition one? Okay. Some many of you do have a black and white browser? What about the Kindle device? Okay, six. And I can rotate phone, tablet, and Kindle. So we have nine kind, nine type of devices in one room. Every device has a different screen. Then you can have screen four to three, 16 to nine, and so on and so on. And this is the reason for the media queries model. The main idea is HTML5, a markup, is just to describe the content. CSS is to style the content. So I have one mark, I have one content, one HTML5 markup, and different cascading style sheets for different devices or different screens. Of course, you can you can use the media queries listeners. So if you need to change something using JavaScript, depends on the screen, you can use the media query listeners. And again, let's have a small look. So first, demo, which, have, which is just a demo for nothing, but it's a demo. Now, I, when I change the screen, everything is changed inside. I'm just changing the screen. No JavaScript inside. And let's make some, you know, something more real. So by hand, a standard web page. Now comes something with the netbook. So it changed a little. Or oh, then comes someone with mobile phone. One content, three cascading style sheets. Nothing more. Oops. Back. Okay. And again, I have my mobile phone. Uh, this demo, this is an uh, emulator of Windows Phone. Inside is running the same demo pages I am showing you from my Visual Studio. And now I rotate my phone and I have in landscape. Put it back and it's in portrait. So you can really ask for a lot of things around the screen. So if you look to specification, dimensions of the screen, ratio of the screen, black and white, and so on and so on, portrait landscape. So how's it done? Very simple query. If this is true, we will use this style. If you want to uh, the same for, uh, sorry, for the tablet orientation, I just use two different linked style sheets, portrait, landscape. That's all. Selectors. Again, this is the excellent sample that the specification 
is following needs of the industry. Okay, the typical usage. Imagine you have a big dynamic created table on the server. The table is quite big. And what's the usual request from your customer? Okay, it's a big table, I cannot read the lines. Please make every second line different color. The name for this is a zebra stripe. How you do, how do you do this? On the server, so every second line has different class, it's dynamically created. Or on the client, using JavaScript, typically jQuery library. Now, it's a part of the specification of the CSS because the idea is what is usual, I don't need JavaScript, put it to specification. So you can use the structure, pseudo class it, it means you can specify or you can work with the position of the element in the document object model or you can use the uh, UI element states it means the book, the checkbox is checked, the field is valid, or it's not valid, it's required or not required, and so on. So, please, I'm a developer, I'm not designer, so my zebra stripes look strange. So I show you the result. It's colored. Okay. And as you can see here, I have table and there is just TR inside TR, 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 TR. No class names, nothing like this. And if you go to the script console, no script, no JavaScript inside. So, for example, this one. Apply this rule to all TR elements, which are the first child of the parent. So it means the first TR. Last child or nth child. This n iterates from the zero, or you can, or you can use the keywords odd even, but this is, I think, real. So it's for every second one, and this is for every third one. If you want to make the every third line different color, you will use three n, three n plus one, three n plus two. Of course, it's a just small sample. Those pseudo selectors are more of them, but I think this is the typical usage. Yeah, sorry. The question is if you can do this with columns. Uh, I think yes, because there are the columns are TD, so you will use the TD and one. 2n, 2n plus 1, 2n plus 3, and it's again because TD is the, f is the child of the TR, so it will work. This is the same, but you know, in a different way, but it should work. Okay, grid layout. In the CSS3 specification, you can find a new layouts for the screens. Typically, what are using to layout screen is the retro guys are using the table, the, the modern guys are using uh, absolute or relative positioning of this element. But uh, it's not so easy to use it. So we have new layout modules. The one is the grid layout. The second one is the box, uh, flex box layout. I will speak just about the gray, uh, grid layout. It's very simple. You take an element diff and you tell, okay, this element will have five columns and six rows. And every child element you can put to another tell. And of course you can specify that something is the fixed size, something can grow depending on the screen resolution or the screen size. Uh, this new layout modules came from the standard applications. So maybe if you are if you are familiar with the Windows Presentation Foundation or WinForms or Swing or G GTK, TK or those you know frameworks for the user interface for the non-web applications. The grid is very common stuff. Flexbox layout is something like stack panel in the Swing or in uh, WPF. Okay, grid module. So I have a uh, few diff elements. This is the main one, it's the grid one. I just, uh, again, 
vendor prefixes it's it's very new module so grid column the first one second one first row second row third row and if you run this in the without the support you can read it it's no problem and if I run it with support it's in my grid and the position in the grid is very simple grid column grid row starting with the one What to do if you need to test how your page looks like in different browsers? So how to do it? Of course, you can have a lot of browsers installed on your computer and just checking how, how, looks it, how it looks and so on. Or you can use some tools. One of them is the expression web for super preview. This is a tool which allows you to render side by side one page in different browsers and compare them. And what's nice, you don't need those browsers to install on your computer. Because you can use some cloud rendering engine. Okay, so I'm connected to cloud. Internet Explorer 9. Let's take Firefox. www. I don't remember the page from yesterday. The Serbian one. Never mind, I take Czech one. This is num.cz. This is the biggest portal in Czech Republic. This is num.cz. And we can render it. On the, left, on the right side, it renders. Okay, I have. And as you can see, if I point on something in one part, you can show the same area on the left side. I think the most funny way is to put it, to use the overlay, and typically somewhere down you can use its, its little shift. But it's visible, it's okay, it's fine. This you can use just for testing the layout of the page. You cannot test JavaScript or input from the user, nothing. It's a just static render page, and you can just check if it works, to get, if it works or not. And now we will work with something more interesting. Uh, Data URI, it's a quite old system which allows you to embed binary objects like pictures directly inside the page. What is the reason to do it? First, if you have a lot of small images inside one page, it's better to download it in one time than to download a lot of small images because it takes more time or you need to have just one page without external links. For example, you need to send this web page to someone. Theoretically, you can use the system to embed audio and video content directly inside the page, but I'm not sure if you want to make uh, you know, the page like two gigabit size of, uh, because of one video or something like that, but it's possible. I have here for a very small sample, I'm using uh, Expression Web 4 because there is a support for PHP and there is a very simple PHP code. I read file from disk. This file is around 70, 750 kilobytes big. And then I convert this binary array to the text using base64 encode function. And the result is I have embedded image inside my web page. It's a one file. And if you look to the source code, you can see this is my image. And the source used keyword data, mine type, type of encoding. It's, uh, it's optional because the default one is base64 and it's not possible to use another one. It's for the future. And here is my picture. And 
Now we will have a short look to the canvas. Uh, canvas is a new element in HTML5 markup language, and it's a canvas, so you can paint on it. Uh, I show you 2D canvas. Uh, there is a 3D canvas. The 3D canvas is not part of W3C recommendation. Uh, there are, it's uh, in, it's uh, developed by independent group Kronos. This technology is WebGL. It's 3D canvas. You can do a lot of very interesting, nice, you know, 3D stuff with that. But there is a huge security issue because this uh, WebGL system goes around the uh, web browser sandbox. It goes directly to graphic card driver. And the uh, last security issue was that if you write a smart way code, you can make screenshots of all screen and send it outside the computer. I think it's not so good. So if you want to use 2D canvas, you must have the canvas element inside and you are using the JavaScript to draw on it. So you cannot make a static canvas picture. Every time you want to use canvas, you must draw it on the client using the JavaScript. Uh, because everything you draw on the canvas, it turns to bitmap. So for example, if you want to animate something on the canvas, you cannot tell, OK, put it to this coordinate, then put it to a new coordinate, and new, and new. It doesn't work. You must redraw the canvas. There are use, you are using here the typical keyframe, typical frame animation. So every frame you must render. And because the usual way how to render it is to use some set timeout or set interval to render again, again, again. So it, there can be some issues with the performance, and especially the issues with the performance on the mobile devices, which are depends on the battery. Because if the, if the rendering is done with the wrong way, it can consume a lot of battery. So, so typical usage is set timeout, and the timeout is zero, because everyone wants to run it as fast as possible. But it has no sense. So do you know what is the shortest interval for redrawing screen for animation which has sense? Well, it's shorter. 25, so, oh. okay, what is the refresh rate of your typical LCD? 60 hertz, it's 60 milliseconds. Anything shorter than 60 milliseconds, you cannot draw because your screen is not so fast for that. So we have the new method, request animation frame, which is, you know, which, do, which does some optimization against capabilities of your of your LCD or of your screen. For example, it doesn't run the animations, uh, the request animation frame doesn't run if the animation is not visible or the canvas is not visible. For example, the, Windows, uh, the web browser window is minimized. But there are some issues or you need to know more techniques about animation. Because typically animation where the people are doing animations, it depends the speed of the animation it depends how fast you run this redraw, 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 redraw cycle. But now it can change because sometimes you need to wait for something and so on. So you need to count, think it's the name for this thing, it's the usual name is the game time. So before you start animation, you start some time counter and your animation must depend on the time, not on, on how many times the animation was called. So my recommendation is, if you don't know these techniques and you need, want to do some animation, hire some guy from the game development because those guys know what to do because they know more taxi, for example, double buffering and so on, to make nice and smooth animation with the low cost for your CPU and GPU. Okay. Demos? Uh, I expect you know the paint application in the windows yes it's i think it's quite good for me so i'm a developer and, you know i don't need photoshop really open it i show you result first this is the result 
Remember that every object has shadow, please. I hope you see it. I have canvas here. Nothing inside. Remember, you cannot make static image with the canvas. You must use JavaScript all time. I take. Uh, I first I found my canvas element. Get element by ID. Now I check if the canvas is supported in the web browser. The recommendation is don't check the type of the browser, Internet Explorer, Chrome, and so. Check if it's something supported or not. The easiest way here you can see you can try to call, you, you can try to call some method or parameter which is specific for some element. If there if there is not this method or property, this element is not supported. Now I get context to canvas so I can paint on it, and the system is very simple. I set up my brush. Same is in paint. First I click what I want to do. I want to use this color. I want to use this stroke and so on. And then I tell, use this brush and fill a rectangle here. Again, I change the brush or I add something to brush. And again, just stroke rectangle, not fill one. And here I have some gradient. Remember, every object had the shadow. The reason for this is that I set up shadow here at the beginning, sorry here, and I didn't change it. So the brush, you know, remember everything. If you want to draw something new, change the brush, draw, change the brush, draw. And this is the system. If you want to animate something, you must draw the scene again, 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 and again. You cannot do something like that you to save this rectangle as a variable and in the future change some parameters. It's not possible. If you paint something on the canvas, it's a piece of bitmap and that's all. So animation, I have a method draw screen. I start that I delete everything on the screen and then I draw my ball. I'm drawing a ball circle on my canvas and then I calculate new position. So, nice animation. run it in browser, in different browser, which supporting request animation frame, it's uh, Internet Explorer 10, and you can see the animation here is much faster. Why? Because my animation depends on how many times it was called. And here is the code. First, I test if the browser supports request animation frame. If not, I test it with MS vendor prefix. If not, Mozilla vendor prefix. WebKit. If not, I use the old one set timeout. Again, request animation frame is quite new stuff, so you must use those vendor prefixes and it can change in the future. As I told you, the canvas is a, bitmap, is a bitmap system. So you can draw a bitmap image on the canvas. And you need to remember only one thing. I create the image, I set up source, and before I can use the draw image, I need to wait to load image in the memory because it then takes time. And you can do a lot of things with this. You can scale it. You can take just uh, some piece of the image, crop it.
And what, what about if you want to draw this image rotated? So the system, or if you want to rotate something, the system of the rotation is very simple here. You don't uh, rotate just one thing. You rotate the whole coordinating system. So first you rotate coordinating system, and everything you draw after that step, it's rotated. Just rotate coordinate system. If you want to, if you don't want rotation, you must put it back. And it's not enough. I hope you remember my picture of uh, Airbus. This is the same picture, but the colors are inverted. What's very nice on the canvas, you can access every single pixel on the canvas and you can change it. So you can make some kind of, let's say, let's, tell it, let's uh, call it screenshot. So you make the screenshot of the canvas or the, just of the piece of the canvas. Inside this screenshot you find property data and it's an array of pixels. One pixel is a 4 bytes, RGB and alpha channel. You can change it and you can put it back. Okay, here we are. I draw image. Get image data. Give me a screenshot of the canvas. Here I make some manipulation with the pixels. So I just iterate through the array, and here I put it back. And that's all. This code you will see later. And you know, you can with this you can do much more. I hope you what is it found? <laughs> Sorry, it's much better. Maybe you remember how many of you have been on my first the previous session. Okay, so you remember this video. And now you can enjoy video as a black and white. smooth it works because I'm using the technology of the web workers so multi-threading develop multi-threading programming in JavaScript and this you will see tomorrow at the same time in this room so I will speak about this tomorrow okay so it is bitmaps so we did a lot of stuff with bitmaps but uh, now we can use uh, vector graphic too so we can use SVG the scalable vector graphic is the format uh, for the vector graphic originally from Adobe. The specification is almost 11 years old. And you can use this uh, as a separate file or you can use it as a part of uh, HTML. When you use SVG as a part of HTML, it's a part of document object model, so you can access it using JavaScript or using cascading style sheets because it's a real part of the web page. So let's look, let's look for a demos. The first I show you uh, the real usage on the real internet. Uh, Mapi.cz. This is the most used web portal in Czech Republic. And I live in Praha. And I want to go to Brno. It's the second biggest city in my country. And here is my road. I expect you know how maps on internet works. They are 
from the tiles, from the small squares. For every zoom, you have a different set of those tiles. And you can see if I move quickly that it downloaded back and back. Uh, Bratislava is a different country. Okay, here we are. And I again use my developer tools and I look for SVG. And here you can see that the road on the map is a SVG vector image. And it's perfect because I can create the SVG on the client. I just send the coordinates from my server and everything is rendered on the client. It doesn't take resources of my server. Or maybe, do you know, Wikim uh, probably you know Wikipedia. Do you know Wikimedia Commons? Wikimedia Commons is the sister, sister project of Wikipedia. It's a big archive of the pictures, of the videos and sounds. It's uh, uh, almost everything is under Creative Commons license, so you can freely use it. You just need to tell who is the original author. And of course, I know what to search here. I search for cell. And here this cell is rendered as a bitmap image. So when I zoom, it's ugly. You can see it. You can see this pixelization there. If not, I can zoom more. So definitely you can see it now. Because it's a bitmap image. Now I open it as a SVG. And it's a vector image. You can see it's nice and smooth. And if you look to the source code, you can see that the SVG is uh, just some XML file. It's uh, created by the Adobe Illustrator, of course. No one type it, but I know people are, can do it crazy. And it's the SVG. If the SVG is a part of uh, your HTML. It looks like this. I have HTML. Here is my SVG. And I have only one object inside. It's a circle with some name and with some radius. And if, if, when I run it and I click to the circle, it changed the radius. Now I don't need to redraw the screen. In Canvas, I must. Here, I don't need it because I can access the circle because it's a part of document object model. I can take the attribute and I can change the attribute. And of course, I hook up some uh, events. OK, what is the difference between or when to choose Canvas, when to choose the SVG. Uh, now the SVG is more used for the static images because you can create a static SVG XML on the server and send it to the client. And the Canvas is more used for the dynamic stuff like games typically. But it really depends on you what is better, what you need, what you know more. If you have a lot of Java developers, it's probably easy way for them to learn, learn just some new API for the Canvas. If you, know, if you have guys which, know a good, which have good knowledge about uh, XML and so on, maybe it's easier for them to learn SVG. It really depends on you. But almost everything with both technologies, you can do almost the same with both technologies. Of course, the biggest difference is SVG vector, Canvas bitmap. SVG can be static. Canvas must be dynamically created by JavaScript. Okay, I'm on time. So my recommended reading, maybe you saw it, Introductory, Introducing HTML5 by Bruce Lawson and Remy Sharp. There you can see links for specification on W3C. Some links for Internet Explorer 9 and 10. I especially recommend you engineering blog and IE test drive. If you want to test some really new technologies, you can go to HTML5 Labs. You can install some plugin with some new technology like Media Capture API to your Internet Explorer, and you can try this. 
openness and interoperability at Microsoft, everything what we are doing, especially in the in the web browsers, really follows the independent third-party standards, which are you know mostly used like standards from W3C. And please fill my rating. Maybe you will win HTC Mozart. Of course, you must rate me in a good way. Okay. And we have time for questions. The question is, is the HTML5 supports OpenGL? OpenGL equals WebGL. So WebGL is a implementation of OpenGL. But as I told you, there are very big security issues. If you want to use, if you want to create the 3G, 3D, uh, 3D inside the web browser, you can use some plugin like Silverlight or Flash. It's stable, it's fast, and so on. The question is, in which programming languages will this HTML5 APIs work? Just in JavaScript. This is this. Those uh, APIs, I will speak about them tomorrow, they are specific for JavaScript. Okay. So, some more question? change the CSS files depending on the media query. So for its resolution or something like that. Yes, it's possible. It was in my demo with the orientation. So this is this link, style sheet, media, and it really changed switch, switching between the style sheets. Uh, the recommended way, uh, if you do this way, you delay the page, uh, uh, you delay the page visibility for the end user because uh, the parser of the uh, HTML starts at the beginning of the HTML, and when the parser founds JavaScript or CSS, it stopped and put the work to the another parser, like CSS parser or JavaScript parser. And then it goes back again, again, again. So if you link too much CSS files, the system, it takes more time to show the page to the end user. So for example, the, recommended, the recommendation is put all JavaScript files to the end of the HTML. Of course, you can put there only those which you don't need really at the beginning. And the recommendation is to put all CSS files in one big file. Of course, the maintain, to maintain this is bad. So you have, for example, in the new version of IIS, in IIS 7.5, there are some new functionality. Then you just, you can put CSS file to different, you, have, you can have a lot of CSS file. So you can have a lot of JavaScript files. But on the server, you can switch some filter on and it change, at, at, you know, make, uh, I don't know how there is a word for this. You know, it put everything together, deletes on all end of lines and, you know, compress it, everything together, for example, to one big file because it's much faster to download it and much faster to parse it. But you can do it this way. Okay, some question? So no more questions. Okay, thank you. And I hope I will see you tomorrow in my last session about channel five. Thank you.